So what are you going to do? Chloe asked. I'm going to have to buy some used tires and hopefully get this bearing fixed tomorrow, I explained. Then I stated, you might even want to get out here and look for another ride. Now nah, I'll ride it out with you, Chloe decided. Well, in that case, since there's nothing else we can do tonight, it was now after 6 p.m., I'll buy us a couple beers, I stated. That sounds good, Chloe agreed, but the Flying J Travel Center didn't sell beer, so we got directions to a little town called Hazen about four miles away. While I was inside of a beer and liquor store, Chloe got in a conversation with a black girl. I tend to use the word girl instead of lady when referring to an adult woman who is single without children outside. He remained in conversation with her for about five minutes after I came back, and by the time he got back into Kia, he'd obtained her phone number. We drove back over to the Flying J and I parked amongst the big rigs who often park overnight to sleep during long hauls. Being as it was too hot inside the car and we both felt like stretching our legs anyhow, we went back up on a grassy hill to drink beer and chill. As we were walking, the bag broke and one of the two 24 ounce Milwaukee's Best Ice sprung two small leaks that began spraying out a fine jet stream of pressurized beer. Being the good host that I am, I gave Chloe the one that wasn't burst and began having to shotgun the beer I'd wish to sip. All in all, most of my can of beer ended up in my stomach. During our beer drinking, we talked about UFOs and angels and religion and all kinds of things like that. After the beer was gone, Chloe was mostly consumed in texting, both with the girlfriend he just broke up with and the girl he'd met in Hazen. After several hours went by, I said, you're not very good company when you're on your phone all the time. Chloe said, I'm trying to see if this chick will let us come stay at her place. He went on to explain she wanted us to, but lived with her mom, so she wasn't sure about it. It sounded like an awkward situation all the way around to me, but after three weeks of mostly solitude, I didn't want to be a party pooper. Coy eventually said, I was wondering if you were in the mood to get us a couple more beers. It sounded like a bad I idea, so I decided to oblige. It, sounded like it didn't sound like a bad idea, so I decided to oblige. We drove back to Hazen, but everything was closed. He called up the girl he'd met and asked if she knew a place that was open to get beer. It turned out that the gas station just on the other side of the freeway sold beer, so we'd driven about 16 extra miles and never needed to be driven. Nonetheless, we headed back out to the freeway and across the overpass to the other side where we bought two more 24-ounce Milwaukee's Best Ice. This gas station was much smaller than Flying J, but there was a dirt parking area on the side of it, so we decided we could hang out there for the night. As we stood outside of the Kia and behind it to be somewhat out of view, we drank our second can of beer. Since the first one had already worn off, we only got a little buzzed. The big buzz, however, was the mosquitoes, which were just as bad as they had been in Missouri, if not worse. Sometime after midnight, Chloe got a text from the girl in Hazen saying it was okay to come over. So once again, we made the four mile drive to Hazen and arrived at a house which stood as, out as the dumpiest in the neighborhood. The girl explained that we'd have to hang out on the porch. There were a large number of cats all over the porch and the high lawn all around the house. The Kia was parked in especially high grass across the ditch that ran through the front edge of the lawn. Right away, Chloe and the girl were in their own little world, so I felt like a chauffeur that had nothing to do but kill time until the date was over. At first, I tried laying down on the porch and maybe getting some sleep, but the purring cats swarmed all around me as well as the mosquitoes. I decided to take a barefoot walk around the neighborhood to give some privacy. The road, which had cooled down, felt good on my feet, and the mosquitoes weren't so bad when I was moving. I ended up seeing most of what there was to see in Hazen during that 45-minute walk. When I got back, I laid down to sleep in the back of the Kia, and the mosquitoes swarmed me as severely as they had thus far this trip. I was somehow able to get some sleep eventually. When I woke up, Coy and the girl were still talking on the front porch. I had spotted a repair shop when I took a walk around Hazen, so I announced to Chloe that we should head over there. They weren't open yet at the time of our arrival, but people began to show up soon enough. When I eventually was given an estimate for the repair, it was $220. With $182 payment that came available overnight, I was still a little short. The estimate for the part alone was $180. I called around using Chloe's phone since my service plan was expired and found a part for $130 but it was in the next town westward on I-40, Lanook. I had decided to head that way, but before we'd even made it from Hazen, back to the travel plaza, the left wheel went flat. This meant getting a new wheel bearing prior to getting another one was out of, before, prior to getting another tire was out of the question. Chloe asked, so what now? 
The only thing I can think of for us to do is to put this wizard staff, the blue, white, and purple one of about six foot in length, through this wheel, and we each get on one end and carry it back to Hazen to see if we can find a spare. Coy put his hands on his hips and breathed a deep sigh at the grueling prospects of carrying this heavy tire and wheel for 3.5 miles on this hot sunny Arkansas day of July 6th, but then realizing that it was the only option, he said, okay, let's do it then. We each put a towel on our shoulder to cushion against the hard pressure of the staff, and we walked one in front of the other with the flat tire and the wheels being supported by us on the staff. Wizard staff? Is that what you call this? Coy laughed. Hey, if it was an ordinary walking stick of this thickness, it would never be able to support this much weight in the center without cracking, I replied in defense of my title for this locust staff. We had to stop several times and take a break, but we were eventually down to the last mile of this effort. At that point, a lady with a pickup truck pulled alongside of us and suggested that we throw the tire in the bed of the pickup truck and hop in with it. So we got a nice breezy ride for that remaining portion of this trek. The first station we stopped at didn't have a tire, but the second one was able to sell us a used tire for $45. We put the wheel back on the staff with a now inflated tire supported between us, and we began our walk back towards the Kia. We'd only walked about 20 yards before a lady stepped out of her storefront and said, with well, just what on earth are you guys doing? I told her that we were carrying it back to put on her car and that, that was out close to the freeway. But she said, hold on a second. She went back into the store and a minute later, a different lady came out with keys in her hand. It turned out to be another nice breezy ride in the back of a pickup truck back to the Kia. Soon we had four inflated tires and we decided to say goodbye to Hazen. During the course of the day, Coy had told me about his date the previous night. He didn't get very far romantically with the girl and told me there were cockroaches crawling all over the porch. So he wasn't especially hurt by the thought of not seeing her again. It was late afternoon by the time we rolled back out onto I-40. We had only driven for about 12 miles when I felt that bumpiness return in that back left wheel. To prolong the time before having a good clear flat, I pulled over onto the shoulder of the road and we drove at about 20 miles an hour. When we made it to Lanook without the tire going flat, but decided to need, we needed to try and get a couple decent tires in this town, which was much bigger than Hazen. It was dusk by the time we found a parking spot across the road from a tire shop that was already closed for the evening. There were a couple of fast food places a couple miles from where we parked, so we decided to walk there and get something to eat. Cool, we didn't have any money and I was trying to spend mine as sparingly as possible, so we just got a couple rodeo burgers from Burger King. Then we walked back to the Kia and planned to settle in for the evening. Chloe was trying to sleep behind the car, covered in tapestries, and I was trying to sleep in the front seat, but the mosquitoes were too outrageous, and soon we were both on our feet in front of the car, scratching. We sprayed heartily with the bug repellent that I had, but it wasn't keeping them off, so I suggested we walk out to Walmart, which was beside the Burger King, and see if they maybe had something stronger. It was about 10.45 by the time we got there and closing at 11 p.m., so it was a good thing we'd walked at a brisk pace. I found an employee to ask her where the repellent was, and she led the way to the far side of the store, and I walked behind her. Man, you guys have some serious mosquitoes here in Arkansas, I commented. Yes, we do. Scientists come here from all over to study them, she explained proudly. What I ended up buying was Deep Woods Off. It was only half the size of the other can, and it cost about three times as much, but we soon found out that it was well worth the price. It pretty much kept the mosquitoes off us, and we got some sleep. The next day, I tried to get a tire from across the street, but they didn't have the right size. We tried another one nearby, and there was no luck there either. We got directed to try a place downtown, so we bumped down the road another couple of miles to a one-man shop, the only tires he had were 17 inch off a big, that were 17 inch were off a big truck. They ended up filling almost the entire tire well, but they had, still had room to spend. We got the pair for only 40 bucks, so we were back on the road. However, the unevenly worn tire trucks, as well as the bad wheel bearing, was causing the car to pull all over the place. So I decided to keep it off of I-40, and instead we went west using US Route 70. I kept the speed at about 40 miles per hour because anything faster than that felt dangerous. We'd made it to Little Rock, Arkansas shortly after noon. I couldn't find a smaller road to substitute southward from Little Rock, so I was forced to take the I-30. With less curves and a smoother road surface, I was able to drive it at about 50 miles an hour for the first 100 miles, but sure enough, those big truck tires eventually began to wear out too, and when they did, they started beating against the plastic housing inside the tire well. 
I'd been very on edge driving all day, and every time Chloe tried to make small talk, I would immediately make the subject about some problem or concern with the vehicle. We had pulled off at a truck stop about 70 miles north of the Texas state line to take a look at the situation. I decided that I should take the plastic tire well out from around the tire to provide more room for the tires to spin. There was a power outlet on the side of the plaza, so I hooked up to it and got out my drill. I said to Chloe, if you want to make yourself useful, you can clean up some of that stuff I took out of the back of the hatch. Chloe replied, listen, ma'am, I really appreciate you giving me a ride and everything you've done, but you've been talking to me like an asshole today. I knew he was right. I'd been a grumpy jerk all day. I replied, I'm sorry, and you don't deserve to be talked to like that. I was fully prepared to explain myself more about how it was because of the stress of driving this vehicle in this condition, but before I said another word, Chloe replied sincerely, thank you, man, I appreciate that. And not another word was ever said about it. I was determined to make it these remaining 70 miles to Texarkana on the Texas-Arkansas border. Chloe asked me why that was so important to me. I explained it was because when I talk to my kids, I want them to be able to, I want to be able to tell them I made it someplace cool, and that my kids, especially my youngest, would think it was cool that I made it to Texas. By mid-afternoon, I was creeping along the shoulder at about 12 miles an hour. There were times I had to bring the car to a stop so Chloe could get out and move some piece of tire or tread or other road debris off the shoulder. Finally, at about 5 p.m., I pulled into the Texas Welcome Center at the edge of town of Texarkana. After so many days of failing to get to places, this felt like a minor success for a change. There was a lush green lawn around this welcome center and plenty of shade trees. I'd bought peanut butter and jelly the night before at Walmart, so me and Chloe had a couple sandwiches at a picnic table. As we were sitting eating sandwiches, a couple and their little boy were walking around a picnic table about 20 miles away. I said to Chloe, my eyes aren't that good. Is that lady a supermodel or what? Chloe looked in my direction at the couple and said, hey, they're smoking a joint. You should go ask if they have a bud they can spare, I suggested. Chloe wasted no time and sprang to his feet and approaching the couple. I watched as he spoke with them, and I was a little disappointed to see him returning empty-handed. But as he sat back down, he announced, they said they're going to leave us something. When they finished talking, they laid the remainder of their joint on the edge of the pavement by the picnic table, and Chloe went and retrieved it when they headed back to the car. Even though the couple had felt safe enough toking out in the open, even with her child, me and Chloe decided that we should get more out of the view to toke ourselves. We were conscious of the fact that we portrayed something of a criminal element to a portion of society, but to a broader portion of society, they liked us. Like so many buddy movies, we were two dudes of different ethnicities pitted together by circumstance and involved in an adventure full of challenges and obstacles to overcome. In the film industry, the buddies are typically cops, but as Chloe and I, well, we were on the road. We each got about three good tokes off that roach, and that was left that was left for us, and it was enough to catch a good buzz. Much better than any I caught off the stuff I got at that dispensary back in Illinois, which made me wonder if that stuff was even real weed, or perhaps some sort of low THC government hybrid. After catching a buzz, I decided to just walk in the shade barefoot in the clean grass, which felt cool and fresh on my feet. Meanwhile, Coy sat at the picnic table and searched for things in Texarkana on his phone. Eventually, he came barefoot and met me in the grass. Man, this grass do feel good on the feet, don't it? Yes, it do, I agreed. And you notice something missing? What's that, Chloe asked. No mosquitoes, I said. Yeah, I noticed that, Chloe remarked. I ain't been bit one time. Even over by that pond where you'd expect the mosquitoes to be, there's none, I told. Really? I didn't even know there was a pond here, Chloe replied. Yeah, it's over there. I pointed as I began walking in the direction of the pond. Chloe walked along beside me, and as he did, he pulled out his phone. Hey, man, check this out, he said as he pulled up a web page of a mission in Texarkana. On the web page, it showed a picture of four of the men who ran the mission serving food. I commented, I bet if you impress those four men right there and show them you're determined to build yourself up, they can open doors for you to help you. Yeah, man, Chloe agreed with a deep sigh of hopefulness. Then he pulled a map of driving directions and said it's only four miles away. Okay, I said. We will head there later, though. I want to let the sun go down so the roads cool off. It's still six more days till I get my unemployment, and I'd like to make these tires last that long if possible. Yeah, man, that's cool, Chloe replied. Besides, I want to let this buzz wear off before I go to a mission, I added. Yeah, I was thinking about that too, Chloe laughed. So we walked to about 10 p.m. before we headed in the direction of the mission. I could tell that my tires were about to pop, and we were still over two miles away. I sported the parking lot beside a closed down restaurant and said, I think I better park this thing here and we'll walk the rest of the way. Really, Chloe asked? But knowing how serious I felt about 
car issues and having experience for himself, me stating, these tires are about to pump, just before they did, he said, okay, ma'am. So we parked the car and headed in the direction of the mission. Coy's phone was informing us of the most direct route, so it took us through a residential neighborhood. Many of the houses were pretty worn down, and some were boarded up and abandoned, but some were not. I thought out loud, I bet these people wouldn't appreciate apps directing homeless people to walk past their house in the middle of the night. Coy replied, nah, man, we're fine. In retrospect, I agree with Coy's choice to shake, to shake his self-conscious, unworthy feelings off. I was being sheepish to think of it being better to walk a farther distance in order to try to not cause false suspicions. After all, we weren't going to rob or assault anybody. We were on a mission to improve our lives. We were directed to make a left turn onto a road, but ahead I saw what appeared to be a lit up motel sign. But it was so immersed in weed growth that it was hard to tell. I asked, is that an operating motel? Coy said, I don't know. Do you want to go see? Yeah, let's go check it out. I wanted to see how much the rooms are, just out of curiosity, he replied. I wasn't thinking of getting a room anytime soon, but if I was going to end up staying in Texarkana for a while, then it would be nice to get a room for a night at some point. We talked to a manager who happened to be outside of a motel that was set up, that was outside of the motel, that was set up like three sides of a square with the missing side providing an opening that allows viewer to see the courtyard that all the bottom level doors open up to and all the second level balconies look down upon. But this motel had seen its better day and its Spanish architecture was not enough for it to appear as anything other than a dump. The manager told us that all the rooms were $40 a night, $225 a week, and $250 double occupancy for a week. As we walked away from this motel, I said, hey, that would be only $125 a piece, a week a piece. If we both get jobs, then we could set up a recording studio there in no time. Nah, I have too many other things to take care of to get back on my feet and to spend money towards setting up a studio. I wasn't glad to hear that Chloe wasn't so into recording with me as I thought maybe he was, but it was a thought of something quite a few steps from where I was myself, so it wasn't a major disappointment, and at least now I knew his thoughts about it. So I changed the subject and jokingly said, that place looks like where Danielson and his mom first stayed when they got to California. Only it's more run down now. Do you want to be Danielson or do you want to be the mom? Chloe replied, hey, just to let you know, I ain't into none of that butt stuff. What, dude? Do you think Danielson was bleeping his mom? I replied, huh? Man, I don't even know these people you're talking about, Chloe replied. He'd heard me talk about Joe Rogan setting up a com comedy empire in Austin and this and that podcaster who'd moved there. And all along, I was talking about people and things he wasn't familiar with or especially concerned about. So I think he'd have adapted to be able to flick a switch and only half listen when he thought I was talking about things he didn't care about. Dude, I'm talking about Karate Kid. You know, the original one at the beginning of the movie? Oh, you mean with Mr. Miyagi? He asked, now snapped back into full listening mode. Right, man, and that motel looks like the place they moved into at the beginning of the movie, only it's all ran, run down now because Pat Morita died, I restated. Yeah, man, I know what you're talking about now, Chloe remarked with a smile. So I said, do you want to be Danielson or the mom? Because that looks like the place they moved into not long before Danielson got his ass kicked by the Beach Boys or whoever they was. Chloe remarked, hey, did you know they did a remake of that show as a of that movie as a show with the same characters and everything. Yeah, I watched the whole first season, I replied. They got a whole bunch of seasons on Netflix now. It just keeps getting better, Chloe stated. I remained silent on the issue because in fact, setting up a rap studio, like setting up a rap studio was for Chloe, watching more seasons of The Karate Kid was off the radar for my foreseeable future. When we got to the mission, I stuck out, I stuck out my fist for dabs and said, well, ma'am, good luck in there. I hope it works out. What? You ain't coming in? Chloe reacted in surprise. Now I got to get back to the car. I can't just leave it out there, I explained. But man, you'd be able to stretch out and sleep in there, Chloe replied. Actually, dude, when it's just me in the car, I can move some of the stuff onto the front seats and stretch out pretty well in the back, I stated honestly. Realizing I'd made up my mind, Chloe gave me dabs but said, So how are we going to meet back up? I said, I will come back here at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Okay, 11 a.m., Chloe asked to affirm. Yep, 11 a.m., I will be here, I promised. So we parted ways, and I headed back to the car. When I got back to it, I scouted out a better spot and moved the car down to a lot beside of the Burger King parking lot. It was a large dirt parking lot with only a single rig parked in the center of it. 
I got a good night's sleep, mosquito free. The next morning, July 8th, I walked back to the mission and got there well before 11 a.m. There was a library just across the street, so I went there to check it out. When I came back, still a little before 11 a.m., a couple older dudes walked by saying friendly, hey man, up on that corner, they're going to be coming out with lunch bags. I could see the front door of the mission from the corner they were talking about, so I decided to go on and wait for the bag lunch. Hand out. It was only a few minute wait for the lunch, and then I was back past the mission. Toy popped out of the front door of the mission just as I approached it. Hey, man, you made it. I wasn't sure if you'd walk all the way down here, Chloe said. Of course, man, I said I would, I replied. Then I added, it's not like I have a whole lot else to do. Hey, wait here for a second. I have to go sign out. They run sort of a tight ship here, he said, as he let the heavy store shut behind him and then ducked back in. In only a minute or so, he came back out and said, okay, now I can go wherever as long as I'm back here by 11 p.m. Well, if you want, we can walk back up the street. I'm parked on. I moved the car to a different lot, a little farther down the street, I suggested. That's cool. We can walk up there if you want. As we were talking and walking, we reached the end of the mission building, but where we're now walked beside the fenced lawn that the back door of the mission opened into. On the back side of a 10-foot chain-link fence with a barbed wire on top of it, that's where people can go out and smoke their cigarettes, he said. It looked a whole lot like walking past a jail yard, except that the men weren't all wearing bright orange jumpsuits. I didn't want to say anything bad about the place, since Coy had so much hope for it and how it could help him out, but the word concentration camp crossed my mind. I looked up at the barbed wire on top of the fence and noticed that the posts of the barbed wire were strung across the slope to the outside of the fence instead of the inside. I said, well, at least that fence is not to keep pe is to keep people out, not to keep the people in. Floyd replied, yeah, man, they don't play around here. They make sure there's no drugs or booze comes in there at all. They don't even want to hear nobody talk about doing it, getting it, or selling it, none of that. So you make any new friends in there or get to know the people running it yet, I asked? Nah, not really. I just basically filled out my paperwork last night and went to sleep. But they have the internet in there, so I've just been playing my games since I woke up, Chloe answered. Back in Lanook, Chloe showed me games he plays on his phone to pay money for you to play them. Following along the lines of the proverb, nothing is free, I thought to myself how and why something like that exists. I come to several different scenarios of how it could become practical. An obvious thought was in-app purchases and make your earnings hard to redeem unless they're used for the in-app purchases. Combine those two scenarios with ads that run during the game and perhaps you've achieved a game that's financially justifiable. Another scenario is that it is a government-funded program that just wants to occupy certain people's time as well as embed special permissions in the app that enable spy capabilities. This was something I mentioned briefly when Chloe told me about his games that pay him money but I didn't elaborate too much about my suspicions because Chloe thought of it as a positive thing and I didn't want to crap on his parade. Chloe was considerate of my thoughts like that too. For instance, I had to suggest for him to put a seatbelt on. I said, I'm not trying to be bossy, it's just that the way this vehicle is acting, I don't feel 100% confident about not having an accident and I'd feel terrible if you got hurt. Chloe quickly fastened the seatbelt and said, man, that's what I was thinking, but I didn't want to offend you and make you think I didn't trust your driving. I replied, man, that's some shit I'd do. Sacrifice my own safety to avoid hurting someone's feelings. As we walked the roadway back to the neighborhood road, we had the night before in the opposite direction, Chloe commented about how the road had all these black lines through its reddish pavement. It gave the appearance of a structure made out of oddly shaped stones, a variable size that were pieced together with black mortar. I said, I think that's because the road has cracked from the heat and then they've sealed up the cracks with black tar. Coy said, yeah, it is black tar, as he reached down and touched it with his finger. Then he added, man, that's crazy that the roads get so hot here that they crack. It probably happens after a hard rain when the moisture gets up under the pavement. Then when the sun heats it up, the moist ground swells beneath it and cracks the road, I suggested. Then I said, most cars can probably drive across this pretty smoothly without even being affected by all this uneven surface. But I think if I was to drive across this thing in my car, It'd be shaking all over. Chloe laughed as he said, it'd feel like we were break dancing. I was glad to know Chloe was in tune with what a struggle it was to drive that Kia. In a smooth running car, I can feel quite comfortable with just a finger tip or two on the 
steering wheel but the way my car was pulling in different directions it was a struggle to keep it rolling somewhat straight even with two hands on the wheel i figured that coy hadn't fully been aware of that having never driven the vehicle but after his joke about it feeling like it, we were break dancing coming across the road like that, that let me know that coy was more in tune than i thought he had been i said to coy man wait till you see what kind of shops are on the street where i'm parked why's that he asked there's like four or five different tire shops and automotive repair garages. Just like that, you ended up, just like you, ended up finding what you need to be and where you need to be right now. I ended up being exactly where I need to be right now too, I stated. As we walked past a dude toking a hand-rolled cigarette, a strong smell of good marijuana hit my nostrils. Damn, I wish I had some herb like that, I commented him. Man, I can't even be thinking about no weed right now, Coy replied. I didn't say it, but I began to realize that Chloe and I were now on two very different pages of life. This change had come about quickly, less than a single day's time, but I accepted the fact that Chloe knew what was best for him right now, just as much as I was confident and secure about what was best for me. As we made it through the residential neighborhood and reached the road with all of the businesses, we made a left along the sidewalk and began an uphill walk. Dude, I wonder if there's a place on this street that sells earplugs. There were two guys snoring last night so loud it hurt my ears, Coy exclaimed. Damn, I said, thinking about how annoying snoring would be if it was actually hurting my eardrums. It's unreal, man, he surmised. There's bound to be a place up here that sells earplugs. I think there's a place that sells just about everything on this street. As we approached the business district, I pointed out two separate auto repair places that came into view immediately. We stepped into one and discussed getting a wheel bearing replaced. His price quote was in line with what we were given back in Hazen. This suggested to me that it was going to require an extended stay in Texarkana in order to afford the repair. Afterward, we walked down to shops where Coy searched for earplugs. When we stopped into Family Dollar on Coy's third attempt, he finally found his relief for his snoring neighbor situation. We walked on towards the, where the SUV was parked behind the Burger King. But actually, but as we crested the hill from which it came into view, a heavy rainstorm was approaching. Ah, shit, man, it looks like it's about to rain hard, Coy predicted. Yeah, I think you're right, I agreed. And then said, well, there's really no need for us to walk all the way down there anyhow. I figure you probably want to make it back to the mission before you get rained on. Yeah, I probably should, Coy confirmed. Okay, dude, well, at least now you know where I'm parked. I remarked, so where do you want to meet up tomorrow, Coy? replied well since they give out those lunch bags down there at 11 same time same place i answered okay cool coy said as we bumped fist i said this town might be might end up being where we part paths but for now we're still in the same place that would be the last words we would speak to each other in texarkana the rain began not long after i got back to the kia and continued for the better part of the next two days while I was sleeping in the car that afternoon, a policeman knocked on the door. He asked me to step out into the rain to talk to him. He said that the Burger King employees who walked past the car on their way to work were concerned about the car and the stranger parked in the mostly empty neighboring lot. I explained to the young officer my car issues and the timeline planned for the repair, but I indicated it would be taken care of during the next week rather than the two or three weeks I had been considering. The cop was satisfied with my answers and told me, well, I'll let you get back out of the rain then and good luck. The next morning, when it was still raining, I elected not to walk back down to the mission. I figured Coy wouldn't be too surprised or disappointed considering the rain. In actuality, I was out walking around in the rain, anyhow, just out of boredom. Coy's determination to stay at the mission till he got back on his feet made me feel that my plans to head down to Austin could be a distraction toward what he thought was best for him. My initial satisfaction from arriving in Texarkana had faded after I'd seen most of the extent of town. I did, however, find a more secluded wooded spot to move the car. I had to perform the clearing to make it a campsite using scissors this time, for it seems I had managed to leave my handsaw back in Charleston, Missouri. When the unemployment money appeared in my account on Wednesday, it began, I began talking to tire shops. The first one wasn't especially friendly, as they said they couldn't help me, but the second one, Jeremy's Tires, sold me two pretty good tires for $60. I headed back out of Texarkana at about noon amidst light rain. It was clear 
by the handling of the car that all this driving I'd done on bad tires had made the bearing situation much worse. I'd begun to realize that it wasn't just the hot roads that were causing these tires to wear out so fast, but also the heat generated by the friction inside the worn out bearing wheel hub assembly, that the total tire heat was dangerously hot and I felt lucky the tires hadn't actually caught fire. But the late rain was a helpful comfort as I pressured on towards Austin. I took a back route rather than interstate, which ultimately led me to State Route 79. The car seemed to be manageable at speeds up to 50 miles an hour, so I aimed to keep my speed at about 45. I bought a tobacco vape in Texarkana and rewarded myself with a vape hit for each 50 miles of driving. I periodically checked the tires, which held up for well for several hours, but around 3 p.m. the clouds cleared up and it became another hot and sunny afternoon. I made a few extended stops in shady areas attempting to allow the wheels to cool down, but by 7 p.m. I had exposed I had exposed steel belts once again. The handling became much worse. I had to slow down to about 10 miles per hour. Shortly after 10 p.m. I was driving on a flat as I approached a town called Milano. A cop pulled up behind me with his lights flashing while I rode on the rim. Since it was going to be a whole nother week before I had more money, I decided to ride on the rim for as far as I could, as far as it could take me. But the friendly officer directed me to get some sleep at a roadside park instead. My sleep was not, a rest, not as restful as normal due to having higher nicotine levels in my system than I was used to. I woke a little before dawn and resumed my driving. However, my speed had been reduced to four miles per hour in order for the vehicle to not feel like it was going to shudder completely to pieces. I was informed in Milano that I was still looking at another 50 miles or more to Austin. Also, my gas mileage had been greatly reduced due to driving on a flat. It became clear that I would not make it to Austin on the gas I had and all my money was spent. I arrived in the town during the heat of noon on the July 13th. I found a dirt road gravel clearing beside the road for which to pull off the road. As I sat there sweating, I rested and looked around, but had it in mind, I was soon going to walk down the road and check this town out, which it appeared was going to be my home for the next six days. I spotted a man walking on the other side of the road who appeared to be as broken and sweaty as myself. As he crossed the roads towards me, I thought out loud, as if there was someone listening, I hope he doesn't come over here and ask me for a dollar. But rather than approach the car, he continued walking in the same direction. I was prepared to walk myself. Suddenly, I saw him bend down and pick something up, which made him say, holy shit. Then he bent over again and again, picking things up and said, another one. I realized he must be finding money if he was that excited, so I jumped out of the car and rushed in the direction, asking loudly and excitedly myself, are you finding money? By the time I reached him, not more than 15 seconds from when he first picked something up, he'd gathered $730. He was so happy and feeling so blessed that he handed me a $20 bill and a $10 bill as he tucked the $700 bills in his pocket. Man, $700, and I was just taking a walk to the store, he exclaimed and then suggested to me that I keep searching those weeds in case there was more. I searched the grass for a while after he left, but all I found was an expired Mexican driver's license. I was filled with such conflicting thoughts and emotions. If only I hadn't sat there for those few minutes doing nothing, it would have been me who found that all that money. $730 would have been plenty to get, that car, to get the car fixed, like it should be. On the other hand, I suddenly had $30 just handed to me out of generosity and kindness by a man who I suspected to come to try and bum money from me. The devil on my shoulder said, that money was meant for you. But I'd have to be the devil myself to not realize that the angel on the other shoulder was right in stating I was fortunate that I'd been blessed with anything at all, considering where my thoughts were at as all this happened. Of course, in the back of my mind was that third voice saying, that shit was staged. This is some kind of reality series. Fed funded. Psych op. Just messing with your mind. So there's what happened. And now I was able to continue on driving because I could stop at the gas station and half a mile ahead and add fuel. So at a steady four miles per hour, I drove through the 100 plus degree temperatures. The audio book I'd been listening to of Richard Francis Burton's Arabian Adventures in Mecca seemed quite fitting. He discussed riding camelback at two miles per hour through the heat of the desert. It was like a stereotypical old man saying, well, you think you have it rough. Back in my day, at about 3 p.m., a young man and his dad pulled up beside me and said they had a tire shop and could help me out. But I had to, I'd put $20 in gas and estimated the total amount of money I had to be $12. The $10 bill and a couple dollars left on my debit card. So I told them I only had 12 bucks, but they insisted I stop anyhow. They were willing to help. 
When I arrived at the tire shop, it was probably 15 minutes later, and they had been there for a while. The father was in the office, and the tire shop was being run by three young men. I forgot to mention that earlier in the day, I'd found a tire laying beside the road, which would fit my rim. So the $12 would only have to cover the labor. However, it turned out that my flat tire was so badly shredded by all the driving on it that they couldn't remove it with the machine, which usually does it with ease. As these three men struggled with hand tools for the next half hour, it was I was doing the math in my head and realizing that I was becoming the opposite of a valuable customer. I was becoming a burden. Just as they were preparing to give up, one of the young men discovered a donut spare that would fit. So they gave me the donut, they gave me the flat to throw it back on top of the car and mounted the donut in its place. They asked the dad in the office how much to charge me and, to, and he told me don't charge him. He told them don't charge him anything. I was so grateful and felt like I was familiar with these young men at this point that I got in my car and I pulled out the club I had carved with a face on it out of a piece of cedar and gave it to them as a gift. They were all three impressed by the club, which I refer to as a skull crusher, and they thanked me profusely. I had told them I was on my way to Austin, and one of them said, you could sell those in Austin. I hope to, I replied, although I'd first have to get my hands on some more cedar and have electricity to run my rotary tool before I'd be able to do that. As I prepared to drive away, one of the young men jogged up to my door and said, hey man, I just want to tell you, I admire what you're doing. It takes a lot of balls. I thanked him for the compliment, and then he warned, now remember, don't drive on that donut more than 50 miles per hour. Don't worry, I won't, I replied, knowing in fact I'd be lucky to be able to drive 20.